There was one scene in, I think, the Christmas special where there was a sort of initiation rite where Cartoon had put a cut in his chest and then the other character, Steve, had to sort of drink the blood from the wound. And um, it was suggested I might want to cut that. <laughs> and I thought, mm, I'm just going to not cut it and see if they ask again. And they didn't ask again. So oh, wow. so that was fun. Hi there. Thanks for tuning in to episode 30 of the Rostrovita Project. If you enjoyed this episode, then give it a share on social media, drop a review on Apple Podcasts, like, subscribe and follow the show on Instagram and Twitter at TRTP Pod. Today's guest is a writer, actor and producer who co-wrote such shows as Heaven and Dr. Terrible's House of Horrible, but it's probably best known for creating, writing and starring in the UK television comedy series Ideal. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Graham Duff. So uh, where'd you grow up? I grew up uh, just outside Blackburn in Lancashire, at Great Harwood. It's like a little market town. So, um, yeah, so I'm from the north. So I lived in, I was 18 and came to Brighton. So that's where I sort of uh, I spent my life, basically. And like um, spent a lot of time going to Manchester and stuff because it's only 45, 50 minutes away on the on the coach or whatever. So Was Manchester your closest city? Uh, Blackburn would have been the, the closest city, but Blackburn, uh, Blackburn's a massive town. You know, it's got a cathedral and everything in it, but uh, there wasn't a lot going on there. So, yeah, Manchester was the nearest big city with you know exciting stuff happening. Because this was you know talking about like late seventies, early eighties, it was it, it was really exciting. But then that's slightly disingenuous to say because Manchester's always been a real sort of hub of uh, of. of you know, exciting stuff culturally. So I think probably any time is a good time to grow up near Manchester. But yeah, I felt very lucky to be there. Yeah, late to the eighties, very exciting time. Oh, awesome! I had some questions about your childhood actually. Um, I had an interview. You said you had dyslexia. Uh, that was something I struggled with as a child as well. Obviously, still now, but more so as a child because mm. that's when you're trying to learn to read and write. Um, was how well known was dyslexia? when you in your childhood um i don't think i heard about it till i was much older probably till i was about 12 13 um my dyslexia has never been diagnosed either um i just for a long time thought i was thick because i've also i've also got dyscalculia which is dyslexia with numbers and i've got that much worse um like when I'm tired and stuff, fours and sevens look identical, which is really handy. Um, <laughs> and when I was very young, the numbers just swim around. Um, and so, and if sometimes if people are saying one number, I hear another, and writing down phone numbers oh, is a God. nightmare. Um, that sounds terrible. So, yeah. So, and and that I, I wasn't even aware of uh, that was a thing until I was in my thirties. So, yeah, no, I, I did. I just thought I was a bit dim, really. Um, and uh, some teachers seem quite keen to back that uh, theory up. So, yeah, I was al- always, from when I was, I don't know. Uh, see, I couldn't read till I was till I was nine. But then once I could read, I was just like started devouring, uh, you know, James Bond books, Doctor Who books, and so on. And then I just wanted to write. I wanted to write all the time, and that, that's not really changed very much, to be honest. Did you find you had a clicking point then when it all started to make sense? Yeah, I can remember reading. Um, um, my mum had bought me a copy of um, the the very first Doctor Who novelisation, Doctor Who and the Daleks, and um, I was so into Doctor Who when I was when I was little. It was like you know m- the main thing I thought about all the time, and I think that was the thing. I was presented with this book, and I think before then I just thought, I thought, well, why would I need to read? I'm not interested in you know none of these things that people seem to be. In- and didn't appeal to me and then suddenly there was something about Doctor Who and I thought oh I really wish I could read that and um yeah I, so that that was the turning point really it was just it it was um 
a, a need to know is not the phrase, is it? But it was it was something that I felt passionate about. So that drove me to learn to read. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, I agree. It, but 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 because I didn't learn to read till I was nine, I missed out on a lot of those sort of classic childhood books that, that everybody loves because, yeah, by the time I could read, I was too old for those. You know, Thomas the Tank Engine or whatever, you know. That kind of stuff so what about you when were you diagnosed i was diagnosed pretty young actually like uh i don't know how old i would have been but like second year of school maybe second or third year of school i just yeah. wasn't picking up stuff as yeah uh as fast as everyone else and I, I had a similar thing to you but i didn't actually read a full book until i was like 19 by myself so i sort of had a a bit of an audiobook situation going on with my parents who used to read to yeah. me as a kid and then that kind of went away as a teenager but yeah no it wasn't same with you it wasn't until I found a book that I was interested in that I was actually like oh wait I can actually sit concentrate and read mm. yeah yeah there's that thing about getting something back I think you know because when you're at school all things want to, they want you to read are school books you know yeah. it's like well those aren't your choice are they you know you don't like why would you want to read those <laughs> I think as soon as it's something that you sort of think oh there's something in this for me then that um uh, that's the turning point probably so what um early like writing projects did you do that uh no one's ever gonna hear or read but you really loved at the time <laughs> um i i probably this probably sounds a bit arrogant but i'm, I'm sure i loved everything i did from very early on um <laughs> but but then i think that's not to say that i thought it was um wonderful piece of writing sorry but i just loved doing it i think and i just loved creating worlds and uh, having the control and learning how to you know define stuff and so on so yeah i don't know when i was when i was at school i used to literally fill whole exercise but english exercise books with stories you know when they say write three pages on someone i literally wouldn't be able to stop you know and, um <laughs> people say you're coming out to play and i'd be going no i'm gonna i'm just gonna carry on writing this story um so yeah i don't know like i See, so, yeah, so when I left school, um, there was only three things I was sort of in any way good at, and that was the English drama and fine art, um, you know, or, or, you know, showing off, making up stories and, uh, and drawing pictures, you know, to put it more bluntly. Um, so, yeah, I, I didn't, I never sort of thought I could be a writer, I think, because, because of the dyslexia, because, I don't know, I don't know, it just didn't seem like an option somehow. Um and so I know I was into drama, so I wanted to act and I wanted to go to RADA, but I was too young to even apply. So I ended up, but I set my sights a little lower, so low, in fact, that I went to uh, Blackburn Technical College <laughs> um, and I was doing art, did foundation art there. Um, and then writing started to creep into that, I think. And I started writing before, you know, uh, this was early 80s and performance art was sort of a... a, a an avenue of creativity that hadn't previously been open, you know, and uh, it, it was performance art was sort of in its infancy, really, I suppose, at that stage. And, and I think I was interested in doing, doing that kind of thing. And around about the same time I was doing that, I started um, working at uh, Factory Records in Manchester. They had a video department called Icon, and I started working there as an assistant um, editor. Working implies I got a wage. I didn't get a wage, but you know, we we had the facilities, and, and <laughs> you know, we made promos and stuff. I mean, a, a guy called Brian Nicholson, who was he was the technical uh, the technician, uh, audio visual technician at, at college, and we started doing things together. And so, yeah, so I think. I sort of early, it was sort of probably in my late teens, got this idea about combining visual things and theatre and video and, and 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 writing, and then the writing became more and more central as time as time went on. Um, when I when I came to Brighton, I did a um, an arts like a combined arts course, and me and a few people on the course set up our own sort of theatre company, mm -hmm. and. Again, it was a little bit performance arty, but it was very funny and it was very surreal. And and um, we did songs and installations and all kinds of stuff and weird costumes. And it sort of, it was never big, but it sort of took off whilst we were at college. Um, and so we were going off and doing tours and stuff and playing in Amsterdam and and like playing at festivals in the, in the UK. And, um, and suddenly it was like that became more important than doing the course, even though it had been inspired by the course. And then writing became a bigger and bigger part of that. And then I sort of realised this is what I want to do for the rest of my life, basically. <laughs> it, was, it was, you know, write for performance and, you know, 
uh, I'd, I'd sort of always, I'd always had a hankering to do, you know, just creative stuff, be it music, theatre, whatever. But I realised that I, I didn't mind spending hours and hours and hours on my own, just just listening to music and just creating, or you know, not not always on my own. Sometimes collaborating with other people, um, but I think that's that's what I think a lot of people find daunting with with writing is is like when we know it's finished, how we know when you've done enough, you know. And it's like I I just embrace all that. I don't mind. Never have done. That's excellent. That um, was a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh, was procrastination ever something you struggled with? No. No, not no. I can say that quite confidently. Really, not not um, not for a second. Um, I'd always, I'd, I've said this loads of times, but I'd always be right. I'd prefer to be writing something that I think I might not use, might throw away, rather than not write. You know, and, and I think it's very easy, particularly when people are starting off, just to to sort of. One of my favourite quotes is is by uh, William S. Burroughs, the author, and he says, um, "Editing is for on the page, not in the head." <laughs> and I think it's very simple, but I think it really holds water, you know, because a lot of people can, you can sit there thinking about, should I do this? Should I do that? No, that's not quite right. So I just think just write, just get it down, just write, get it in some manifest form that you then make better, hmm. you know? And, and so, um, no, procrastination has not, never been a, a thing that I've struggled with. And, and um, I sort of, I, th- I think in a way I sort of make it impossible for myself to procrastinate because I, I've always got six, seven or eight different things on the go at different stages of development or whatever. So if I ever get stuck on something or if I don't fancy doing something, you know, that, then, well, what about this other stuff? What about this? What about that? You know, so I always make sure I've got stuff to keep me occupied. I'm really not a fan of, of spare time, <laughs> of free time. It doesn't, doesn't do much for me, you know. Um, that thing about, oh, I wish I could spend a week lying on a beach. I think, no, I don't really. Yeah, I mean, I just feel fortunate I've found something that – you know, I'm moderately good at and I can just about make a living from and I really enjoy doing it. And I just think, well, that's got to be the best, hasn't it? You know, it's, um, I don't know who we said, there's that phrase, isn't there? Find find a job you'll, find a job you like and you'll never do a day's work in your life. You know, and I sort of think that I discovered that one, mm. that, you know, the secret to that. <laughs> Absolutely. Who were like your early comedy inspirations? Um... The thing that I was into from when I was very young, um, my mum gave me, um, well, she didn't give me, she had a couple of uh, Tony Hancock albums um, and also a Bob Newhart, if you, if you know Newhart, as an American sort of satirist who did monologues, um, but, um, which I quite like, but she had the two Tony Hancock albums and I just, I taped them and I just listened to them till I knew them inside out. Um, so Hancock was like a massive thing for me. Uh, comedy that was my favorite thing and it was weird because it was you know this was in the early 70s now of course if you if you were 10 10 years old and you got into Hancock you could find out all about him it just seemed like a sort of ghost from another dimension you know so nobody I knew knew about him so it felt like this hermetic little world that I was allowed to enjoy and then my grandparents bought me another Hancock album for my birthday I think the following year and then I was just obsessed so I like that a lot of people of my generation uh, were sort of really taken by uh, Monty Python's Flying Circus which I quite liked but it wasn't it wasn't a big thing for me in a way is for a lot of people of my generation I think I was just once I discovered Hancock nothing else quite <laughs> quite hit that that level I think so that was probably my biggest well not probably definitely my biggest uh, comedy inspiration as a writer and I, uh, and I think it probably remains you know those sort of cadences those sort of structures where it's not about gags it's about uh, reaffirming the character and 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 I don't know the, the sort of meeting of the the highfalutin and the quotidian. I, I, that's that's manner to me, you know. I love all that. So I, um, like, I mean, the, the thing I'm best known for is is ideal, and I think there's a lot of that sort of Hancock esque stuff. You know, I'm not comparing it in any way, but there's a definitely an influence of Galton and Simpson in the way those those situations are, are, are structured, and and some of the you know some of the turns of phrase, I suppose. I don't think I've plagiarised. I think I've just been influenced, but you can quite be tell. Hopefully not. Um, was your first writing job an appointment with Doctor Terrible? 
Um, those terrible times of horrible. Um, no, I, that was that was my first. That was the first TV series that I wrote. Mm. Um, yeah, so that which would have been two thousand and one. So now before that, I'd or I'd already had my own series on Radio Four called Stereo Nation, which was um, based on an Edinburgh show I did. It was about music and each it was like a sort of anthology thing so each there's six episodes and each one I played like a different music obsessive so one, one was like um the, this guy ran a club really dodgy guy ran a club there was another guy who was like in a Welsh indie band and you know sort of just coming at it from different angles so that was 98 so that was my first that was my first show I suppose uh, before that I'd done things like on loose ends on radio four I had a column on that and done bits and pieces but yeah but Dr. Terrible's House of Horrible was the first TV series I did which I sort of came up with the idea and then I pitched it to Steve Coogan and, and Henry Normal at, at Baby Cow and then um did you the know them friends. before then no no I basically met them in in I had a meeting I, I sent in a um a pitch, which I think was like a literally a page and a half. It was quite minimal um, for the series. And then we had a meeting and it was incredibly swift, particularly for like my first thing. I mean, thank God I wasn't writing it on my own. I think, you know, I was talking about, you know, getting a piggyback, but, you know, Steve and Henry were like incredibly accomplished writers. So I, I came up with not all, but most of the storylines and then we wrote, them together and then there was one that the three of us came up with together and then one that Henry and I wrote together but then we'd all pitch in um you know as as, as we went along um so yeah I think from when I had that first meet I think I had that meeting something like September 1999 and April 2000 we started shooting or something so it was really you know you could feel the g-forces from, from but it's a classic thing that always happens with commissioner it's like they um and ah and um and ah and then they say yes and as soon as they say yes you feel like you're behind schedule because they say yes um, but it's in this amount of time so you've got a really short period of time to write all these scripts and it's like <laughs> never fails to happen never fails <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy um what's the dynamic like of writing with other people versus writing with yourself um it depends on the people it, it, and, I, and I, so i don't mean that in a judgmental way it just you know because you, you just form different dynamics i've tended to be whoever i've written with i've tended to fall into the position of the person that does the typing um which is got pluses and minuses because it's really nice i'm sure to be the person that's just pacing up and down and chucking in gags and thinking of you know dreaming stuff up you're part of that process as well because you're bouncing off each other but you've got to make it manifest and then the other thing you've got to do is then when you're at home later you've got to edit it up and make sure it all makes sense and stuff so you get you know that's nice that you get that sort of um you're able to finesse it if you like yeah it goes through so many stages, you know, as soon as you get into production, things change and, and so on. But, but yeah, no, it's, um, I mean, I think sometimes working with people, um, you can make leaps that you wouldn't make on your own because you suddenly bounce back off each other really quickly. An idea just suddenly escalates and, and, and it's really one of the great things on a selfish level, one of the great things about writing with other people and particularly the comedy writers is you can just end up in fits and giggles about stuff. And quite often about gags, there's no way you can actually put in the programmes. They're too silly or too rude or so irrelevant. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so that's nice. And, um, but then equally, you know, sometimes when I'm writing on my own, I'll, I'll think of something, and I won't necessarily be laughing out loud, but I can snigger for a good half hour. You know, it's it's a, it's a it's a pleasant way of uh, of spending time, um, but also sometimes you, you feel the pressure as well. Um, so you know, sometimes people said you prefer writing on your own or writing with other people, and it's like I really don't mind. I'm happy to do both because you get different things out of different ways you know i think sometimes one of the downsides of, of working with other people sometimes is um you can set off down a cul-de-sac and your joint enthusiasm doesn't somehow you get blinded to the fact it's a cul-de-sac and you're sort of riffing on there with that and that and you know you're making all these notes and they get at the end of it and then somebody will go yeah but doesn't that contradict that thing we just all oh, right yeah i'll forget that then you know and then you, you're half an hour later and you've spent all this energy and giggled yourself silly and stuff. um so yeah it's it's it swings and roundabouts as they say 
Yeah, I had another question that's quite similar, but it's like, how much freedom do you have when you're writing for a show that's already like established and then you're just hired to join in on writing an episode? Like what, what creative well, I, do you I, have I've in that? Well, I've not really done that. Have you not? Oh, okay. my, um, most of my stuff is sort of, uh, how to say this without sounding wanky, um, <laughs> most of my stuff is sort of more authored than that. Mm. I, yeah, I tend to get involved in projects where I'm, I tend to create things and then make them. I sometimes join in with other people's parties, but but not very often. But also, I don't get asked that often. And I think it, I think that's possibly because my stuff tends to have quite a strong flavour. <laughs> not everybody wants that flavour in you know in their shows. Um, you know, a lot of my stuff is quite dark, I suppose. So um, you know, that's the not that's not to everybody's taste. Um, but I mean, what I do do, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't write on other people's shows, but what I do do is um, I will script edit for other people. So um, I've just been script editing a, just before Christmas, a series for Johnny Vegas and Sean Gibson for, uh, for UK Gold, which is, which is written by a guy called Jason Cook. And he and I co-wrote a series called Heaven with Vic Reeves oh. a few years back. Um, so that's interesting because you, you, um, and I would say to any aspiring writer, actually, it, doing a bit of script editing is really useful, looking at other people's stuff, because it um, it helps you just to see writing as raw material. Because when it's your own writing, you remember how much time you invested in writing a certain scene or developing a certain character or whatever it might be. And um, it's best to be dispassionate when you're writing, when you're editing. And script editing and other people's st- stuff really helps you with that. So, um, Does yeah, that so like, um, with- make it easier to do on someone else's than your own, then, script editing? Oh, definitely, yeah. definitely. Um, I, do, you, I don't think you can script edit your own material. In fact, I know you can't. And, and, and yeah, I, I mean, I've literally been script editing somebody's script, and, you know, I'll be saying, oh, this is great, but you need to sort out this, this isn't quite clear here, this could be funnier, that gag there's so funny, turn it into a running gag, you know, those are sort of simple stuff. And then the next day I'll have a meeting with, um, you know, somebody like Henry Normal or somebody who'll be script editing one of my scripts, and he'll point out exactly the same issues in my script. I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but, you know, the same stuff will come up. But I won't be able to see that because I'm too involved, too close to oh. it, you know. So it's that thing about having an, eye, an outside eye. And if the outside eye is somebody, you know, who's done a, you know, got a body of work behind them, then you you trust them, you know. And you, so, um, yeah, it's 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 interesting because I think we always think that we can be really objective about our own work, you know, or some of us do. And I think you can up to a point, but then beyond that, it's... I think because there's always stuff in the work that's hidden from the creator as well. You know, we don't realise everything that we put in. You know, sometimes I'll look at something I wrote a few years ago and I'll see threads in it. And I think, oh, that must be a theme, but I wasn't aware of that at the time, you know. And, and, and But it just only only the distance allow, allows you that perspective. Yeah, so... But I do I do like working on other, other people's stuff and... and um, and I like you know with script editing, it's I think you just you have to be selective. You know you can't polish a turd, so it's like if you, something has to be decent to start off with. You can't you can't make something out of now. You know, so I want some. I don't know. I've always just felt I want to be able to stand proud next to anything that I've that's got my name on it. You know, so it's like sometimes people ask you to to work on something and you just think that's not really my sort of thing. It's not something I'd watch. So so I can't get involved. You know, some people. Are, probably more professional I think that's that's probably unprofessional of me that that I've got that attitude you know because you should be able to say well just use your skills and earn a wage and just get on with it but it's like if I'm not into it and I can't I can't fake it you know and and then then you can't do your best work and then if you can't do your best work you do substandard work and then people sort of look on the work oh grand did that and I just I'm not having that you know I'm just going to make sure everything I do has has got a certain quality you know um (laughs) I'm not saying that everything I do is brilliant, but I'm just saying that everything I do, I can stand by and think that that's how, within the limits of time, within the limits of budget, that's how I want it to be, you know. And um, and like I say, it's it's always got to be something that I personally would want to watch or listen to. I couldn't do it just 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 to create something just for the money. So it's not not the way my mind works, really. Sadly, uh, where did the idea for Ideal come from? 
Um, well, initially, I mean, there's a lot of different ideas in there, isn't there? but the, the core idea um, came from the show I was mentioning earlier, uh, which was an Edinburgh show where I played a series of different uh, music obsessives and um, a very loose label, that really, but, uh, and that, then that became the, um, a Radio 4 series called Stereo Nation. And one of the episodes of that, I played a character called Moz, who was uh, a weed dealer, but also in, in, in the radio thing, he was a bit more of a bedroom DJ as well, which Moz in the TV version wasn't so much. Um, so yes, the episode where I, where I, um, where I played characters and um, it was, there was two characters in the series that I thought had shows in them. There was that, and there was another character called Vinyl Jeffries, who was a secondhand, uh, second or secondhand record store, uh, record shop. And I put together pilot scripts for both of those. And the, the Vinyl Jeffries one, which was called Primo Platters at the time, got more interest and enthusiasm and stuff, got, kind of got some development money and things. And it just seemed, it was with this TV company, and it just seemed to never quite get the momentum. And in the meantime, I just got a bit bored hanging around with it. And so I made my own pilot of, of Ideal with um, a few friends who were actors and a friend, um, Martin Maloney, who was a, a, a director. And then I showed that to Henry at Baby Cow, and they liked it, and they commissioned some scripts, and then it, and then it went to the BBC, and they commissioned a series. And and um, it was something I wanted to do, but I wasn't optimistic that that one would get commissioned. And and I always say to people, you know, if you develop develop a few ideas, you know, because you can never tell what's gonna what's gonna get bitten. And I thought a show about a drug dealer was an unlikely one, yeah. you know. But it's more likely now. But we're talking uh, when you know two thousand and. Four, two thousand and five, you know. So t it's like times moved on fairly swiftly since then, and it's like drugs and drug awareness is much more part of the debate now, where it was a more outside thing then. So um, yeah, but no, it, and I was surprised. I thought there would be more outrage. Not that I was courting it, I was interested in outrage, but I thought there'd be more articles about why is the BBC spending you know our money on this kind of nonsense. But <laughs> there was none of that. So <laughs> it was great. We were just allowed to to, to get on with it. That's super interesting. So, um, how much did you have to cut from the original idea to get it on the BBC, or did they just take it pretty much how it was? Nothing. Didn't cut. Didn't cut wow. anything from it. The, uh, the original pilot, uh, the format was slightly different. I mean, obviously, it was me playing Mars rather than Johnny Vegas. But um, Joanna Neary, who plays Judith in Ideal, she was in it, but she was playing Jenny, the childminder, in that. So that's quite <laughs> weird. People see that now, but the the format of it was it was um, the police had got surveillance cameras in in the flat, and so you were watching it through. So it was a lot of the same events. A lot of what happens in episode one is is the same stuff that happened in the pilot, but you were viewing it through surveillance cameras. Yeah, so um, that. I don't think they even said you've got to change that. They were just saying, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you'd have more freedom if you didn't do it like that. Um, and so I thought, yeah, fair enough. And they said, oh, you know, would you be interested in Johnny Vegas? But so I met Johnny and we got on really well. And it was, you know, and, and then suddenly I was look, reading the scripts and hearing his voice and thought, yeah, this is perfect. And um, the baby cow, to Henry at baby cow, said, well, just another character for yourself, you know write another character for yourself to play to play in it if you're not playing the lead, which I did. Um, so no, it, I mean, the whole thing was 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 quite interesting, really. It was a real lesson in terms of how not to censor yourself. Um, because, you know, I was already doing a show about, about a drug dealer, so it was a bit late to start getting coy, you know, about what we were doing. So um, there was a few things I thought pe that there would be questions about, like, I mean, I don't know how familiar you are with the, the, the series, but there's a character called Cartoon Head in it who yeah, yeah. wears a mouth mask, never eats. Um, and I thought, and obviously, you know, it ran for seven years. By the end, it's just part of the fabric of the show and people think it's whatever it is. But to begin with, I thought, I thought somebody would say, well, this is a bit weird. What's going on here? Why is this character gone? Why is he never speak? Who is he? What's, you know, we need, why has he got no, you know? And it never came up. There was one scene in, I think, the Christmas special where there was a sort of initiation rite where Cartoon had put a cut in his chest and then the other character Steve had to sort of drink the blood from the wound and um it was suggested I might want to cut that and I thought <laughs> mm, 
I'm just going to not cut it and see if they ask again. And they didn't ask again. So, oh, wow. so that was fun. And I thought that was no more perverse or weird than any number of Hells Angels, you know, initiation rites or whatever. So, and the thing is, when you watch it on screen, it comes and it goes and it's, it's creepy and it's a bit disturbing, but it doesn't feel out of step with the rest of the narrative, you know. So no, I was, I was, it was amazing that I was given such a free hand with that, you know, and, and choosing all the music. And, and uh, it's like once they said yes, they sort of let us get on with it, really, you know. And the only involvement we had, we had from the BBC, I don't sound like a real art here, because you know, I'm not, I'm not on a, somebody who's going to sort of like defend the BBC down to the, but, but I'm going to say in, in this instance, the, 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 you know, the sort of interventions, we not intervened, but the sort of involvement they had was all really positive and encouraging. So I, I feel very fortunate, very fortunate with that show. Uh, that's good. Did you, when you were writing, I imagined you you sort of imagined certain act- actors playing certain roles. Did anyone actually end up playing the role you thought they were going to play when you first imagined it? Um, in terms of the main characters, no, but then I'm not sure. I'm not, to be honest with you, I'm not sure. And early on, I did have people in, in mind particularly. Um, there was a couple of actors that I knew who, who were friends who I put up. You know, I suggested they went for parts. Um, there were a few characters that were written specifically for certain um, like actors and comedians. Joe Neary is one and Peter Slater is another. And, and they... But because of the way the whole thing was set up, they still had to audition. But then because the scripts had been written for them, they did the best performance. So, no. Uh, um, so that was good. And, and also, you know, as it went on, just inviting people to do cameos and stuff. And, and it's like about 98% of the people we asked to do cameos said yes. You know, and, and there's all sorts of people who said, you know, oh, you'll never get Paul Weller. And I thought, well, we won't if we don't ask him. So let's ask him, you know, and his assistant said, well, I'll ask him, but it's very unlikely he'll want to do this kind of thing. And, you know, he came back, he was a fan of the show, and he said yes, and he came oh, along, and he was brilliant, you know. So, <laughs> no, the only person that turned us down was um, Kate Moss. Oh. And she said she didn't want to do anything associated with drugs, bless her. Uh, <laughs> but everybody else we asked <laughs> said yes, and that was great. So, you know, getting Marky e. Smith to play Jesus and stuff, it's like, you know... It's not even bucket list stuff because it's stuff you wouldn't dream of putting on your bucket list in the first place because you wouldn't think it was possible. So, yeah, no, all that was really good, really good. Uh, that's so funny. Um, that's one thing that I do got right, actually, was, I don't know even how to put this, but how stale his flat looks, Johnny Vegas' character, and just how messy. Yeah. I, feel, I feel like some other like weird comedies that, the sort of living environment looks a bit too clean. Uh- <laughs> yes, yeah, no, not, it wasn't a house proud man by any stretch of the imagination. One thing I, 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 that we did in, in Ideal that I've seen done since, but I hadn't seen done before then, and it's not a big deal at all, was just having washing up drying, you know, having washing over radiators, having washes on our clothes horse and stuff like in the background. Of things. It's like, you never see that in, in you know, now, but you used to see that in soap operas because it looks ugly, you know, but then it is a part of life. So it's just, I find it interesting when you can do things like that. It's not groundbreaking, but it's just that it's like it just gives it an extra little sort of patina, you know. I like those sort of things, those details. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Uh, what was it like working with uh, Johnny Vegas? Wonderful. Is is um, he's a really really talented actor. I mean, the thing you know, he's obviously funny. He's you know the man has got funny bones. There's no question about it. He's not capable of of not, not being funny. He's incredibly generous and, and you know giving as a. I'm saying that's such a lovely. Year. But he's 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 very um, he's really very dedicated to his craft. I think people think that Johnny just rocks up, has a few beers and spouts off, you know, but it's absolutely the opposite of that. You know, he's devotes devotes so much time to his craft. It really means a lot to him. And certainly as an actor, you know, it's good that, you know, following on from my deal, he's done he's done other sort of decent um got other decent parts, you know. Because I think he's a really good actor and he's um he just feels really authentic. 
And I think he's, you know, he goes method on stuff, you know, it's like in Ideal, there was quite a lot of emotional territory covered, you know, with him having to cry or get angry or, you know, modulate his mood through through sort of lengthy conversations and stuff. And he just hits it. He, he turned up, he was always word perfect, you know, and I work with a lot of actors and that's not something you can say of everybody, you know, and it, um, he was always sort of completely on it. So yeah, no, it was it was great. And I think people always think it's it, it must have been like an absolute bun fight, but far from it. Far yeah. from it is um, is very very nuanced as, as an act. And um, yeah, it was a real, working with him again recently on this uh, UK Gold thing was a real pleasure. So hopefully we can do something else again soon. Uh, amazing. Uh, I noticed when I was rewatching it recently for this interview that there's a lot of slang. Uh, terms that I don't actually recognise. Uh, is that quite? Is that like kind of up north slang that's used in the show, or is that some of it even made up words for the script's purpose? Both. both. It'd be both. I think. I think a lot of it is is stuff from the northwest. Yeah, a lot of it is Lancashire, Cheshire sort of slang. Um, but I do make up a lot of words as well. So I didn't realise until recently quite how many I do make up. But you know, like my spell check is always like not recognising stuff, and I was thinking, yeah. This is because the only oh, yeah. this is the only computer it's on. That's why I don't recognise it. <laughs> no, I, I've always liked making making. But it's like the thing of like you know you form a band and you spend all your time making up the band names rather than writing songs. <laughs> don't you? Uh, so I saw on Internet Movie Database that uh, Ideal Film has been announced. Is that anything you can talk about publicly at the moment or no? Oh no, that's that really shouldn't be on there. That I don't know who put that on there. That that's been on there probably about eight or nine years now. <laughs> Um, we were developing a film for a while. Yeah, but it's not, I don't know who put it on. It wasn't me, it wasn't John, so I'm not sure. Um, we was a, a film for a while and we had, we had a script, but um, it just sort of, I don't know, it just didn't happen. Um, I think the, I was sort of working on it and then another, I can't remember what it was now, but another project came up that, you know, I had to deal with straight away, so I was doing that. And then some, the, some of the financing wasn't quite working out. And I think everybody on it just sort of, Everybody on it, see me, Henry, and Johnny. Really, we we just it just sort of I don't know. We couldn't we couldn't get we couldn't get to the stage where we could get proper funding to develop it at that point. So it just fizzled out. But no, I don't know if I knew how to take things off off it. I'd, I'd take I'd take that off off there. But, so no, that, that's not happening. Funnily enough, um, just before the lockdown, we were talking about doing a um, a stage show of Ideal. Oh. That's like it. a reduced, for, you know, like with a, a smaller cast. So we were just about to start early discussions about that, and then the lockdown happened, and of course that's, that's been knocked on the head. We, we might pick that up at a later point. But, um, it's been knocked on the head for, for the last 12 months anyway. Uh, that's that's <laughs> awesome. Uh, so for all the things you've written for, uh, what's the favourite character you've worked on? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Um yeah, it's too many, really. I mean, you know, obviously I like sort of lead characters in, in, in the stuff I've written and, um, you know, and the stuff I've played and that. But I don't know if you have a favourite character. It's a bit like, you know, i got three sons. It's like, I couldn't tell you who the favourite oh. one was because <laughs> the other two would kill me. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I I think I've got this thing. I've got a few things. But um, one of the things I have is... Um, it's like I'm always most interested in what I'm doing next sort of thing. And, and, and also I don't like to repeat myself. So I like whatever I'm doing to be different to what I just did and stuff. So I don't know if that's any way to run a career, but that's, it's about keeping, I don't know. I think part of it's about not falling, not allowing myself to fall into a comfort zone. So I can't sort of think, Oh, it's this sort of thing. I always do this sort of thing. So it's, I'm sort of thinking, I might have done this thing before, but I probably did this about five projects back. So this is another, my brain's in a different place now. And yeah, I've just got this real thing about not, I just don't want to end up on autopilot with anything I'm doing. So I'm always trying to sort of change, change the vectors a little bit. So so I've got something different to deal with. And when I used to, I was in a double act for quite a few years and we we did so much touring and stuff. And, and, And I just remember being fascinated by, uh, you know, meeting other stand-ups and talking about how they, you know, how they sort of kept themselves fresh, how they kept, how they kept, um, you know, and um, and one, I remember one stand-up saying to me, uh, "I always make sure I'm a bit hungover when I do a gig." 
And what he goes, well, secondary focus. So you've got something to overcome. So you can't just, so you've got to be on your toes. And I remember at the time thinking, that's, you know, I've never been a drinker, so that, that's not the way to go for me. But, but I remember thinking there is something in that about upping the ante a little bit, you know. Um, so I don't know why I'm saying this. I'm, we've travelled a long way from what your favourite characters are. Sorry, I don't know why I'm just rambling now. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Um, so, yeah, how did you end up on Harry Potter? It's just a gig, just a, a just an acting gig. I mean, I, I um, I'm six foot two with a shaved head, so I only get invited to a certain sort of audition, you know. Um, and so that was for and an, an, you know a baddie basically. And that, you know, if 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 I'm in my own stuff, I I write characters for myself that I would never get cast as because I think. Um, why not? You know, because nobody looks at me and, and, and thinks anything other than henchman, uh, killer, assassin, pirate, paedophile, Nazi. You know, I'm not plucking these out of the air. These are all parts I played. Um, and, and, so, and so the Harry Potter thing was, was just another, another thing like that. And I think, um, I'm pretty sure they probably cast somebody else in the part that I ended up playing and they dropped out. The reason I'm able to say that with any degree of confidence is nobody told me, but the character is called Squat Man. And, and I was thinking, well, I'm six foot two. I'm not squat by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> um, and also I got the call something like two weeks before it started shooting or something like that. So, but it's a tiny part. I mean, people always ask me about it, but it's it, it, it took months and months of my life to do. But in the two films, I'm, I'll am i be on screen for less than a minute, I'm sure. Okay. You know, you see me in the background in some battles and I've got one line in each each film. But it was, it was a fascinating look into... Um, you know, the big budget world of filmmaking. You know, I mean, I've worked on a few of the films, in, again, in very small capacities, but nothing approaching that that scale. And when you're used to working in television where everything is a trade-off with the budget, you know, you, 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 all the time you're sort of think, and then suddenly to be working on that and that money was clearly no object. Um, there was an amazing costume department with some incredibly talented people there. But I remember being told at one point, one week they had 11 people in whose job it was to distress the fabrics. So just to make like the costumes look as if they weren't new. And that's, you know, that's a weird way to spend your day, isn't it? Distressing fabric. But um, wow. so, yeah, they had absolutely, you know, it was, it, I mean, that was the British film industry for about a decade, wasn't it? The Harry Potter films. Um, so you just, you got the feeling when you were there that you were part of this incredibly massive machine, you know, and, um, and you see, I was very ignorant. My, none of my, uh, I mean, my, two eldest sons they were neither none, none of them were into harry potter so i'd never read the books to them when they were kids i'd never read them to myself so i didn't know anything about it really and i was so busy the whole time we were shooting harry potter i was writing series six of um ideal and also i was what was i doing i was script editing another show at the same time so it was it was quite it was quite weird because i would go in by I'd get there about half six in the morning, something like that. By half seven, I'd be in my Death Eater costume with a big prosthetic wound across the top of my head, sitting at my laptop writing. And sometimes that would be all I did because we were doing, shooting this big outdoor battle scene. I mean, it's not exaggerating. And um, I think I was there for, I think we shot the first film in about, or, you know, we shot my scenes in the first film in about two weeks. And then the big battle scene for the second film, the the last of the Hellas film, it took a few months, took about three months, I think. But most days I was turning up there and just typing in a cloak, basically. So it was going it was great because I was getting a chance to to keep on top of my de- my writing deadlines and also getting paid to you know hang out with Helen Bonham Carter and all that. So yeah, it was, yeah, it was good fun. It was a, it was really good fun. But not something I would have ever predicted. But it's um. But like I say, people always ask me about it. But it's you know I'm barely there when you look when you watch the films. I'm barely there. But uh, how much uh, you know uh, CGI goes into being a Death Eater versus like physical acting? Um, I wasn't involved. I know some of the some of the other Death Eaters were involved in some green screen stuff, but I, I wasn't. Um, uh, I did. 
Oh, I did a stunt and it was cut from the, um, oh. well, a tiny, tiny stunt. But it was cut from the second one. There's this big battle scene. And um, Maggie Smith, and I can't remember what her character's called because, like I say, I'm not an aficionado, but she sort of killed me with a, with a wand. Um, and I sort of did this big sort of fall onto this crash mat. And I, th- we must have shot the scene 12, 13 times. And I, you know, I'm game, you know, I'll just go for it, whatever. But by the time you are falling over on a crash mat for the 13th time, you're, you're slightly dazed. <laughs> um, and then it was cut. It was cut because I just thought oh. I would love my mom to be able to go to the cinema and see her son being killed by Maggie Smith. <laughs> but uh, that pleasure was denied her. So. <laughs> Did you ever try and get the, the footage? <laughs> Uh, I've just I've I've wondered if if it's on some deleted scenes on oh, some Harry sick. Potter box set, but it probably isn't. some somebody got in touch with me about two years ago and said, oh, and it was it was somebody I think I was friends with on on Facebook, but you know we never met. They just um, you know like what I posted or whatever. And he said, oh my uh, my youngest son's just unlocked your characters on the Lego Harry Potter uh, game, and I had not a clue what he was talking about. Um, <laughs> So yeah, apparently they signed up my Lego rights to my identity. Ah. I wasn't aware of it. Uh, that's awesome. Do you ever get recognised in the street? Yeah, yeah. Um, not, not as much these days because I'm not on as much these days. But yeah, you know, and it's. It, I'm really fortunate in that anybody that comes up to me tends to be really nice, and you know, because I'm, <laughs> I, I am quite niche. I think you know what I mean. I don't like. I'm not some. I'm nobody. Most people wouldn't have a clue I was, and fair enough. And and actually, I prefer that. I don't. I don't need to be in everybody's face, you know. Um, but no, everybody uh, uh, who's ever come up to me has, has always been really sweet. And and it's interesting when you meet people and they say, "Oh, I grew up with Ideal," you know. Um, and I watched it from when I was ten or whatever. I think, "Fucking did you, Jesus?" <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm ready for that responsibility. <laughs> but um, was it Ideal you no, mainly it's... got recognised for then, or was is there other stuff as well? Yeah. Um, mainly ideal, yeah. Just just because it was on so long, because there's so much of it, you know. Um, but no, sometimes it's weirdly sometimes people recognise you from Harry Potter, you know. But then that's because they're obsessed and they will have watched those films over and over again, you know. And uh, I was at the swimming baths about two years ago with my youngest son and these two boys came up to me and then they were going oh oh you're a death eater you're a death eater and, and i was uh well yeah i was yeah i was like, oh amazing and i was thinking i really don't feel comfortable in a swimming pool being sort of like lauded by young boys it felt really, really odd um but, um yeah, no, and it depends, whatever's on you know it's like when heaven was on people would recognize you from that you know and it's it's so yeah but no it doesn't happen much and like i say i'm not i don't um i don't hanker after that kind of attention i mean it's interesting the times sometimes when i've been out with with johnny vegas and he is so recognizable you know because he's obviously a bit he's he's not the service here but he's, he's loud and so he's really noticeable and he's so generous and gracious with his time you know because people i think there's that thing of people feel that they know him because he's on TV so much, but also because I think his persona is very much, you know, for want of a more elegant phrase, man of the people, you know, and he is. He's, a, he's an authentic working class voice in a cultural landscape, you know, television is still largely middle class. So I think he is, he's a very noticeable and important presence. Um, and people want to talk to him and want to know what he thinks and want to tell him how much they love him and other And he just, he has so much time for people. Um, you know, and I think if I was ever in that position where I was that visible, I think I, 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 I think I'd feel, I think I'd find it hard not to feel some level of resentment, and he just doesn't. So you know, bless him for that, because I, th- I think um, sometimes you just want to go to the corner shop and buy some groceries, don't you? you know? Yeah. And I think once that pleasure's denied you, it's, it's a bit tricky. I can imagine it'd be <laughs> dreadful to be like famous enough where you can leave the house and like not be seen. Do you know what I mean? Mm. yeah yeah so you host a radio show called uh graham duff's mixtapes oh yeah you played my band on there the yeah. other day actually thank you very much 
Oh, pleasure. Yeah. 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 I mean, what I what I tend to do with it, and and this is probably a foible if we're if we're being completely honest, but if I'm in something, I will turn it into work. Hmm. So um, I've always been obsessed by music, and I used to DJ on local radio in, in the nineties, and, and um, I listen to music all the time. I write. And I choose, I've selected most of the music for the TV programmes I, I make. Um, and so it's just, it's just an, it always has been from when I was in my teens. It's a massive passion and also quite a broad spectrum of stuff as well. I'm not, I'm not obsessed by genre in the way that some people are. Um, so I just, I'd always make myself tape and mixtape, you know, when I was younger and then CD compilations and then now just playlists, you know. And, um, and Daniel Nathan, who runs, um, Totally radio I said, Well, you should be doing the show. And I said, Yeah, yeah. And I kept never quite getting around to it. And then um, Marky Smith died in January three years ago. And I was very fortunate to be able to call him a friend. And 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 when he died, I really I really wanted to do a, a show basically that played the music and I, and I could talk a little bit about, you know, what he was like and our friendship and so on. So I did that. And it was that was a bit of a sort of trial by fire, really, because I hadn't done a music show for probably 12 13 years and also mark had only died a few days before and so i was really having to hold it together you know because i was quite upset um and and after i finished i thought well bloody hell man if you can do that if you can you know if you can essentially do a show about somebody that you you're grieving for and hold it together then just just get on and do a bloody show you know (laughs) so so then i started doing it i think about two weeks later i started doing it and um yeah, I, I, it's so it's. I play stuff from all around the world. Um, it's not world music in the in the way that people know that term. It's just people doing independent music from from different countries. And um, one of the great liberating things about Bandcamp, I think, is it just it's a level playing field for anybody who puts stuff on there, no matter how weird, no matter how, how inept, how sophisticated, how sort of outside of a genre it might be. You can just go and have, have a flick through, you know, and, and um, so I've been doing that and I just think I should just play all these, you know. So, again, it's just something that I'm, I'm always fascinated by what's coming up next. You know, and it's, I mean, it's, it's a weird thing because if I like something, I, I tend to never stop liking it. You know, there's things I, I liked when I was six that I still like now. There's, you know, any people sometimes say, oh, the dreadful music we used to listen to in the 80s. And I just think. I didn't listen to dreadful music. Mm-hmm. All the music I listen to in the eighties, I'm still into. So, I, I, so I, I continue to like stuff, but I'm always interested in, in what's happening next. And I'm interested in when uh, you get hybridization, when you get genres mixing, uh, when you get stuff that, that works outside of genre. You know, and that that's something I'm interested in in, in dramatic terms as well. And that's something I've done in, in, in Ideal and in the HG Wells series. And in, I've got a series on at the moment on, on, well, it's not my series as such, but on, on Radio 4 uh, with Alexi Sale called The Absence of Normal. And I've adapted four of his short stories um, as like standalone drama. So there's one more to go, which is on next Wednesday, which has, it stars Maxine Peak, and it's called Locked Out. And that's, that's the last one of this, this four. But it, with those, we sometimes experiment with, with genre, you know, and it's like, it's like we all know how a shock horror moment's gonna, gonna fit within a horror film, but how is it gonna fit within a sitcom? You know, and, what, and can you do it? And if you do, you know, how do you do it? And then how do you recover from that and do the next thing? Or how do you make it suddenly like a rom-com when it's been a thriller and, you know, and it, it's, it's not great art, but it's experimental, and I, I really like experimenting. And I think the Grendel's mixtape is 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 that as well in a, in, a, in a microcosm. It's taking, it's like, so what's it like if you play a really intense Spanish techno track and then go into some sort of country thing from Venezuela? And you know, I just uh, you know, because I think it's a corny thing to say, but it is true. There's only two types of music, good and bad. You know, any genre will find good example. And I think what I, hopefully, what I play on the show is best of breed, if you like. It's, you know, whatever the, whatever the best example of whatever emergent or, or hybrid genre is, or, you know, if people are making uh, post-punk music in, in um, Argentina, you know, who are the best people doing it? Who are the most inventive people? And one of the great things about digital culture now is that is at your fingertips. Mm. You know, so is that when, how you I, find most of your music through, like, online? Uh, mixture. 
Uh, but yes, a lot of it is online. I do spend an inordinate amount of time on Bandcamp. Um, but also, you know, because I've been doing this show three years now, people send me stuff, um, you know, and I'm on a lot of mailing lists. But it's funny, a lot of the stuff on the mailing list is sort of all right, but it's not great. And it's interesting because you think, well, so the stuff on the mailing list is the stuff that uh, A&R people have thought, oh, we might be able to market that. And it's, you know, sometimes there is good stuff there, but quite often I just think, yeah, the reason you thought you're going to market this is because it's actually a little bit inoffensive, you know, or it's a little bit like something else that's already popular or, you know, or the singer looks cute or, you know, those sort of uh, sort of tend to trump anything else for A&R people. So, um so I, I I just go looking. I always I've always gone looking for new music, and, and you know I've spent a fortune since I was in my mid-teens on on music. You know, the, the holidays I could have had, but no, you know, and I spend quite as much now because digital music is cheaper, I suppose. And on Bandcamp, a lot of the stuff I'm buying, you know, I'm not I'm not paying a huge amount for it, but. And I feel slightly guilty about it in, in some respects, but on this fact, anything I buy, I then play on the show. And so it goes to a slightly wider audience than, than would have got afterwards. And, you know, sometimes people get in touch and they say, oh, thank you. know, we've sold five copies thanks to you. And I think, well, that's, you know, it's a small change, but it's it's um, good. it's good. And I, <laughs> I will only play stuff that I really like. I've gotten, I'm not beholden to anything other than just what I think is, is, is good, you know. And, I think I've got a decent ear, you know, I've, I've, but equally, you know, it's probably in some respects the kiss of death been played on my show because it's not, you know, it's a lot of it is quite, I mean, obscure is a weird word because sometimes people say obscure and they're implying that the people that create the music want to be obscure. Whereas I think a lot of stuff, if I play people to my audience, just they can't afford the billboard campaign, they can't afford a PR company, you know, so they struggle. Um, it doesn't mean that the music itself is, isn't deserving of, of a wider audience. But uh, one thing that is great now is just the sheer amount of stuff that's coming out, more so than ever. Mm. There was some stupid article in The Guardian or something recently saying, oh, there's no, there's fewer and fewer bands than ever. And I thought that is utter nonsense. That's, that's, no. that's, that's talk about the music business. That's not talk about music. You know, they, if you look on just a cursory glance through Spotify or, or Bandcamp, you'll see that like, there's more music being made than ever before. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, one thing you uh, touched on there was some people are worried about the music industry collapsing because people can't make as much money from selling CDs now, but you, you're also getting rid of the gatekeepers in a way and also like, anyone can put their music online and some of that is going to be beautiful which is the sort of music you have on your show and actually I have to compliment you for when I listened to the show the other day there wasn't one song I didn't enjoy which is really I I don't think that's ever been the case when I've listened to a music show so yeah it was really nice to listen to good yeah no I I, I do I do spend probably too much time (laughs) doing it because I've always sort of thought because I don't get paid for doing it it literally is a hobby that I'm it's like saying to people come around and have a look at my my, uh, you know train set um (laughs) so yeah I've always thought I don't don't spend too much time I always spend a lot of time doing it but then because I listen, um, a lot of writers can't listen to music when they write, but I, I, 90% of the time I do, so I'm listening to music all the time, and I get ideas for scenes and stuff. Sometimes I'll hear a piece of music and I'll think, oh, that's a scene, you know, and sometimes the music comes first. I've talked, I have know a few people that work, work like that, um, uh, but I think it's sort of, it's counterintuitive because people sort of people always think that drama is about language, mm. you know, and it is about language to a degree, but it's not just about all the other senses as well, really. Not so much smell when it comes to television, but you know, it's it's about um, it, you know the sort of drama that can come about through through nonverbal conflict, through nonverbal action. You know, sometimes like a good music cue will tell you so much more than 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 um, you know a long speech would. Um, but but you know you, you know I think it beholds you to be inventive because I think a lot of people are very lazy with music cues. You you hear the same cues coming up again and again. You know I was watching the Serpent recently, which I thought was an excellent drama. I don't know if you, if you saw that, but um, 
Uh, and but, and generally, I thought the music choices were excellent. And then they uh, they played Nilsson Jump Into the Fire, which is a fantastic track. It's a great track. I, I love the track, but it's used so prominently in um, Scorsese's Goodfellows for a, for a montage. I just thought, oh, you can't get away with doing this again now. It's just, it you just slightly lowered the tone um, <laughs> for me anyway, but I am quite picky. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so uh, you've been very generous with your time thank you very much uh, like two more questions uh, what you got coming up and what advice would you have for people who want to pursue writing as a career okay what have I got coming up um, well I've got the, yeah, the absence of normal series is on at the moment so all four episodes of that I'll be on till the end till the end of next month more or less I think um I've got a book coming out in May called The Otherwise, which is a horror feature film script I co-wrote with Marky Smith of The Fall about seven years ago. Um, so we published the script. We, we couldn't get it made at the time, although weirdly now there is some interest in it all these years later. Um, so it's the script and so, so there's photographs and essays and there's a big section which is... Um, uh, transcripts of conversation between Mark and myself where we're talking about our favourite films and dreams and creativity and stuff. So that's coming out in May. Um, oh, just, uh, I'm filming, well, no, we finished filming now, a documentary feature film about Wire, the, the band Wire. Um, and we finished filming that e beginning of, no, end of fe February. So we're just about to start editing that. So that's being edited through the... Uh, through this, so we're hoping by the autumn we've got a, a, a cut of that. We were planning to go into the film festivals uh, beginning of next year, but that's all still up in the air really now because yeah. for obvious reasons, because of the pandemic. Um, what else? Oh, I'm, uh, we're doing a new. I do a show on Radio Four called Count Arthur Strong's Radio Show, and uh, we do live uh shows of that so we're, we're writing a new live show at the moment so that's but again that's not going to be touring till next year um so yeah that and i'm writing another book um I, I did a book that came out about two years ago called um foreground music a life in 15 gigs which is basically that is like my life from when i was 10 to when i was 50 told through 15 different gigs um so i'm doing the follow-up to that which is a life in 15 films so I'm about two thirds of the way through writing that at the moment. A um, couple of other scripts that I'm developing. Um, no holidays, just that. And and the other thing that I'm doing that I'm really looking forward to is going to some gigs because I've, I've got tickets booked to go to some gigs in June. So I'm going to go and see Teleman, who I love, and also going to see Viagra Boys, who I imagine would, will give good show, I'm thinking. So the, those those are two things I'm, I've got coming up that I'm really looking forward to. Um, yeah, just and, and advice for young writers is just write. Don't think about writing, just write. Try and normalise it. Try and make sure you do a bit of writing every day. Don't be precious about it. Just get it out there, get it on the page, and then you can start making it into something better, you know. Um, and don't write what you want to write. Don't don't try and second guess what, what might write about your sessions, because then you know if it's real or not, if it's got some crunch to it, you know, I think if you're writing to try and suit other people's needs, um, you don't stand as much chance of getting away. There's a great quote from David Cronenberg. I can't remember it word for word, but essentially he says, um, you've got more chance getting a strange idea greenlit than you have a normal idea. And I think the logic there is that, you know, if you're pitching a flat share idea, well, it'll be one of about, 30 flat share ideas that has been pitched at the moment but if you're pitching something about a man who lives inside a giant matchbox that'll be the only one so you know it doesn't mean it's going to get commissioned but people will have an opinion on it is unique to that and also it, they'll just have to judge it on its own merits because it's not they won't be going oh it's another one of those matchbox domicile comedies you know i can't i can't be reading this so um, I might write that one down, actually. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> stick, stick stick to what you're... People say write about what you know. There's some truth in that, but write about what you want to know. You know, don't, don't end up doing research about stuff you're not interested in. Write about what you want to know. Write about stuff that you'd want to watch. I think that's, that's you know, counterintuitive, but I think that's that's the way to go. It's worked. worked. To some degree, it's worked for me, I would say. 
Hey, thanks for listening and thank you to Graham for joining me. For more on Graham's work, go to grahamduff.co.uk and also check out his radio show, Graham Duff's Mixtape, by going to totallyradio.com forward slash shows forward slash mixtape. And that's it. Bye.